Welcome back to another edition of A New Way to Museum. My name is Curtis Schmidt. I'm the Zoological Collections Manager here at the museum. Uh, what we're gonna do today is I'm going to show you guys, we're gonna do a live feeding of one of the rattlesnakes. So I'm gonna be able to talk to you about what's going on, uh, why, why snakes have venom, and what those venoms specifically do. So with no further ado, we're gonna get right to it. Uh, if Reese wants to throw the mouse in here, so this is our Grand Canyon rattlesnake, which is a very, very good feeder for us. So a lot of people don't realize that venom is actually for feeding. When I ask children and I ask people what venom is for and what they think the venom is for, they almost always think it's for defense. It's not for defense at all. It just happens to work out very well for defense. But what it actually is, is a very good, very efficient feeding mechanism. So what happens and what you're gonna see here is the snake is going to quickly bite the mouse and immediately inject venom into it. So that's actually protecting the snake from its prey. Uh, if it's not a venomous snake, something like a gopher snake, a bull snake, or a racer, something that people are more familiar with in this area, um, when they have to attack and kill their prey, their prey fights back. So venomous snakes took that to a whole different level, and they don't have to worry about their prey fighting back. So what you've seen now, you've seen the snake has bitten the mouse, and that venom is going to work now. So there's different components, different things in that venom that do different things to the mouse. Some of them basically make it to the, where the, the mouse can't move. It is paralyzed. But what's mostly going on right now is that venom is working on the inside of the mouse to digest the mouse from the inside out. So not only is it really, really effective for the snake to protect itself from being attacked by its food, it also can quickly envenomate it, put the venom inside it, wait for it to die, and while it's tracking it down, it's already starting the digestion process before the snake even starts to, to eat it. So what we're seeing right now is this, the, the mouse is dying. It's taking some time to die, and this, this varies. You know, it depends on how much venom the snake delivers, it also depends on where exactly on the mouse the snake bites and injects the venom, but they can die almost instantaneously or it can take a few minutes. So that venom is inside the mouse right now, starting to digest and break down the tissues of the mouse. So now the snake is gonna use its senses, primarily the sense of smell, one of the really neat things about it is when a venomous snake envenomates its prey, it changes the way the prey smells to it. So it, instead of just following a random mouse trail, it can actually follow the very specific trail of the mouse that it just envenomated, that it just injected with its venom. So as with most other snakes, it's gonna try to find the head and try and swallow it head first. Which looking at this scenario right here might be a little tricky because now the head is buried within the rocks. <laughs> so we'll see how this particular snake is gonna deal with this scenario. So again, this is the Grand Canyon rattlesnake, only found within Grand Canyon National Park and a few of the areas are very adjacent to it. Very highly specialized and highly evolved species. Now he's probably gonna be confused because they're gonna, he's gonna try and find the head and look for the head of this mouse which is now buried underneath the rocks. Now 
And again, as I mentioned, he knows that this is the mouse that he just envenomated. <clears throat> he can tell just by smelling it. He may just eventually get frustrated and just grab it and try to swallow it <laughs> because he can't find that head. There's really no species of rattlesnakes that are endangered within the U.S. Uh, most of the species that are endangered are endangered or threatened within states that they live in. Um, good examples of those are going to be, okay, he found the head kind of, but he's starting to try and swallow the mouse now. Anyway, good examples of those are the Arizona ridge-nosed rattlesnake and the twin-spotted rattlesnake. So there you go. Now he pulled it out. So they're protected in, the, in New Mexico and Arizona where they live, but that's only because there's very little habitat in those states or in the United States where these species live. Most of the habitat and the range of those species is in Mexico. So in general, um, all of the snakes in the U.S. are doing just fine, for the most part. <clears throat> Why are they important to the ecosystem? Oh gosh, that's a can of worms that you just opened. Um, they're important to the ecosystem because of prey removal, for one. Um, if we didn't have snakes to get rid of lots and lots of mice and rats and the things that they eat, we would quickly be overrun by them. But the best way to answer that is if you remove any natural component of an ecosystem, that ecosystem is eventually going to fail. Uh, basically, it's like removing a cog in a wheel or you know, something similar to that. So if you, if you remove one thing, it's going to affect another, which will affect another, and eventually you're going to have a complete ecosystem collapse. So everything within an ecosystem is equally as important, whether it's plants or animals, insects, snakes, whatever it may be, top predators. They all have their very important roles to play. So now you're seeing it's going to swallow it head first, Really neat thing about snake um, swallowing and snake morphology, I guess I should say, is the skull is very highly kinetic, which means basically there's lots of moving parts. They don't have hands to feed themselves. So basically they have two independent uh, lower jaw bones or mandibles that are connected by a highly elastic band, basically, between the two. Uh, they have teeth on several of the bones of the, the mouth, which will move independently. The teeth grab onto the prey and help pull the prey into the esophagus and then down to the stomach. So if you can see, it's independently moving each side of its jaw both on the top and on the bottom, basically walking over the prey. And with those, cur those teeth that are curved backwards, each time it does that, it grabs the prey and pulls just a little bit. And once it gets far enough down, the muscles of the neck can start contracting to help bring that into the body. Snake skeletons are, are very fascinating. There's really not a whole lot to them. There's a lot of vertebrae, a lot of ribs, and then just a relatively few skull bones, most of which are not attached to one another. 
But one of the things that's really fascinating about the skeletons, even though they are really, really simple, um, you can usually narrow it down to at least the genus level uh, just by looking and identifying the different parts of each vertebrae. So the vertebrae differ enough that you can often get down to species, not always, but you often can. Um, but one of the easiest things is to be able to tell a venomous pit viper, which all these rattlesnakes are pit vipers, from the others is just by quickly looking at the vertebrae. They have a, a longer process than the non-venomous snakes do. So once this mouse is all the way in the snake and the snake is done swallowing, uh, at this temperature, which is about 75 degrees, it will take about three days to digest, uh, which is then when it will go to the bathroom. Most of what comes out in its excrement, or its poop, if you will, is fur, because they can't digest their fur. They do digest the bones, which is kind of fascinating, so they digest just about everything but the fur. Another really fascinating thing that, that, uh, that I don't even have the answer to and, and a lot of scientists don't, is while they're eating, since they do have fangs that they use to inject the prey, the fangs will break off. And similar to like a shark, they always have teeth and fangs that are ready to replace the ones that break off. So the fascinating thing is they'll end up swallowing their own fangs, but they can't digest their own fangs. So they can digest bone of the prey, they can digest the teeth of the prey, but for whatever reason, they cannot digest their own fangs. I've actually gone through some stool samples of these guys uh, and found five or six fangs in just a, in a single stool specimen. So now is when you'll see it disappear a lot quicker because the muscles in the neck are going to help push that thing down. What are some common snakes you can find in Kansas like rattlesnakes? Well, the common rattlesnakes, especially in central and western Kansas, are the prairie rattlesnake, which looks an awful lot like this one, uh, very closely related to this, uh, very common throughout the western half of the state. Um, and then the Massasauga rattlesnake, which is common throughout most of central Kansas. So both of those are here in the Hayes area. Um, they get very close to town. Uh, some of them probably actually do get into town. Uh, but it, within Kansas, we don't have any diamondbacks that naturally occur within the state. We do have some introduced populations of them. Uh, we have the eastern diamondback, or I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, timber rattlesnake, which is found in the eastern third of the state, the more wooded areas. Uh, we also have other pit vipers like the copperhead which is also found in the same areas as the timber rattlesnake. So as you can see, now it's down. It's going to use its muscles to push it all the way down into the belly. The skin of snakes are very, very elastic and, and uh, stretch very easily, as you can see, which is why they can swallow things and digest things much, much bigger than themselves, much wider than themselves. So the stomach will also do the same thing. We'll be able to expand an awful lot. How do they breathe when they're trying to swallow all that? That's also a wonderful question. So their trachea or their windpipe is actually expandable. So it's in, it's in the bottom of their mouth and at rest it's in the back, just like ours is. But when they've got a mouthful like this guy just did before, they can actually stretch it out to where it's sticking out of the bottom of the mouth. So it was breathing that entire time it was swallowing. So it doesn't get in the way of whatever they're trying to swallow. If a person encounters a rattlesnake, how should they handle it? Uh, the best way for them to handle dealing with a rattlesnake is just to walk away and leave it alone. 
Uh, more people are bitten by rattlesnakes, trying to mess with them, trying to kill them, trying to move them, anything like that. Unfortunately, it's mostly trying to kill them. But that is typically when people are most at danger, uh, is when they're trying to kill them or, or anything like that. Most snakes, uh, rattlesnakes included, uh, if you leave them alone, they will go away. Do snakes ever actually kill something that's too big for them to eat? Uh, absolutely they do. Just like most other animals, they often have eyes that are too big for their stomach or too big for their mouth, um, but they will certainly try. Uh, most notably, I think, is the, the water snakes, which are harmless snakes, um, but they will often catch fish that are much, much too big for them to be able to swallow. But they will try for hours to try and swallow it, but it, it just doesn't work. So, too far in, can they spit it back out, or what do they do if they get it? Yes, they, they can regurgitate it. Um, it's usually not very good on the snake. It's kind of hard on the snake's body. But they can definitely regurgitate. And like this snake right here, if he were to, he's very vulnerable right now. If he were to be messed with by a predator, um, he can't get away very fast. He wants to defend himself. He's likely to regurgitate to make himself a little more able to defend himself. So that's all we've got for you. Thanks for joining us in the New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.